Hey, hey, welcome to Over the Horizon. We've got a super duper special episode for you today. Sora AI from OpenAI has been blowing up collective minds around the world for the past few months. There's a lot been happening. I was itching to talk about what Sora would mean for, for Hollywood and for Bollywood and, and the global filmmaking industry as a whole. And I've been waiting for this special episode uh, today with uh, two very special guests. Uh, who I will bring on in just a bit. It was so fortuitous. Thank you, Sam Altman. Sam just tweeted this out. He says, movies are going to become video games and video games are going to become something unimaginably better. Well, who better to talk to about all of this than my guest today, Dr. John Gibbs. Well, you know him on uh, social media as Dr. Know It All and a Bollywood writer, producer and director. Arif Ali, a childhood friend of mine, senior of mine from school, and so I can take a few liberties with him today. Thank you for your time, Dr. John Gibbs, and thank you for your time. Arif, it's great to have you. Good to be here. That's great. All right. So let me begin with you, Arif. What yep. did you think when you saw this tweet that I shared with you a little while back? It's pretty crazy, isn't it? It threw me off my chair. <laughs> <laughs> That's not a good thing for the director. (laughs) (laughs) Gotta stay on there. I don't have much of much idea of gaming, but um, at the same time, it's very reflective. It's it's uh, I had not I had not thought of it this way at all. Mm -hmm. But there is some amount of truth to it, I I suppose. But I would say that that's some a type of movies that are being made. But there Mm -hmm. will always be different different types of movies or OTT or you know all consumption in different ways but uh yeah but it is definitely a game changer and there will be very distinct this this uh, ai uh, versions and you know and real real life versions i'm sure that is that is what is going to happen how much of a i'm curious give me a, a, a kind of a high level assessment of the threat, the disruptive threat, do you see to filmmaking uh, as a whole from Sora as, and all these I, open AI models? As far as I am seeing right now, um, I don't know what what the future holds and how, how what the progress is, but I definitely see that the fringe players more than the main players are going to get affected uh, a lot okay. more. Are going to get replaced. Specialists are not going to go away. Mm-hmm. Uh, which specialists, I mean, whether it is uh, DOPs or actors, but those that are, um, okay, let me say by example, when mm-hmm. we do a, like, when we're shooting a scene of there is, of, of there's a singer performing in front of an audience, right? Mm-hmm. So when we are shooting a film, so you need that singer, the stage and everything, the closes of that, and then you need the shot of audience, like, like 1000 audience. So we have to hire that 1000 crowd also. So that crowd you have to hire and you have to manage, you have to pay them per day or per hours, the, the way, uh, whichever way it is. Mm-hmm. So I feel that we don't need that crowd anymore. So a lot uh, of that you used to be keyed in with the green screen and, you know, brought it in post. Do you see these massive war scenes like, you know, in movies, uh, you know, you, where you've got thousands and thousands of, of soldiers from both sides going at each other? Yeah, see, soldiers is one thing. Soldiers is replicate, you know, you replicate. But you can also design, like, I'm saying crowd, but then mm-hmm. closer home, like, it can also be like a man walking down the street. Mm. Right? So you can have your character moving down the street and rest everybody else who's standing there, who's going here, who's going there. Those guys may not be, can, can be uh, artificially generated, you know. So things like that. I, even in your, I, I was going through a, a catalog today, let's say of a clothing brand. Uh, so your main models maybe might be the same, will be the same because they're recognizable and stuff like that. But your catalog models or anything that is tertiary, uh, more than secondary tertiary, Will all can all be is very replaceable. Like it can be generated. Who needs to hire people and shoot them when you can just prompt and get it in? You will obviously need very intelligent prompters. That that, that might happen. But uh, yeah, 
So I feel that those, those jobs are going to go very quickly. Very quickly. That's interesting. Um, Dr. Know it all. You have a background uh, not only in teaching um, everything your your students about um, animation and and you know all things related to that uh, the University of Georgia, but you also are president and co-founder of Artimatic. Um, so you you bridge these two worlds, and uh, you know as as a creator and as a as a technologist and someone who's really clued in. What what do you make of uh, what Arush is telling you, and when you look at the big picture? Especially with what Sora has done with, uh, you know, take uh, OpenAI's, um, beg your pardon, taking Sora to to Hollywood, and we've seen the the brilliant outcomes. So, uh, well, first of all, I actually happen to be wearing <laughs> my Artomatic shirt today ah, cool. because <laughs> I'm heading straight from this to a meeting with the the head of our MFA film program. Um, at University of Georgia, because he wants to talk to me about AI and, and film. So all of a sudden, everyone is noticing this. So interestingly enough, I saw this coming somewhere around two years ago. Um, and, and so about six or seven months ago, our company started working pretty hard on this because we realized as soon as I saw it, not the original Dolly, but the Dolly 2, and I, I can't recall exactly, around 2022. So, you know, close to two years ago. As soon as I saw that, I thought, oh, well, it's logical that the next thing that's going to happen is video. Now, I it, I don't have a crystal ball. I didn't know if it was going to take two years or 10 years, but it was obvious. Oh, thank you. Uh, it was obvious that that was the direction we were heading. And so I started to talk to my co-founder about it. And, and we were like, yeah, so what can we do? We already had some products in the pipeline. Um, the one that's on the, the website right now that's that's uh, sort of officially announced at this point is Skinner, which is a weight painting thing for 3D models, which is a major bottleneck in the 3D animation pipeline. But we also have other stuff that's in the works and just about to be announced. <laughs> in fact, in fact, if you're a friend or family of ours, you actually already know about it because we've been releasing it slowly um, to people because we just can't overload our servers. But mm. but aside from that, so so I'm, I'm just saying that like what Sam posted this morning, uh, my response to it actually was first, whoa, and second, yeah, I knew this was coming and we've been working on this. So <laughs> so that was, that was, and then people have been responding to that going like, what are you talking about? So yeah. uh, it, it's one of those things, I always use a surfing um, metaphor, I guess, because I love to surf, even though I'm not very good at it. But if you see something coming, if you see the wave coming, and in this case, it's the AI revolution in the arts, if you see it coming, you either paddle hard and try to catch the wave or you miss it. <laughs> or worst case, you get tumbled by it and you end up just getting smoked and smashed into the ground under, under the wave. So, um, so you know, it's, it's, I think, time for all of us. And, and to put this in perspective, I have been a, a writer, director, designer, <laughs> mostly designer, um, sound recorder, sound, all of that stuff. I've done tons of work in the film industry, tons of work in the animation industry. One of my children is actually in the film industry in New York, and the other one is a music recording engineer and composer who lives here. So all of us collectively have a huge amount at stake, just like Arif does. You know, we're looking at something that's like, wait a second. I, I, I've, I've noticed this thing with people with AI. They say like, oh, it's cool that AI is happening, but not my job. Whatever that, whether you're an accountant mm -hmm. or, or a filmmaker or whatever, you're like, you're comfortable if it takes somebody else's job, but not when it comes into your backyard. And yeah. this is feeling very much like it's coming into our backyard right now. It, it's coming in and it, it's coming in like a freight train. It's just, it's just moving through very quickly. Yeah, there you go. So that's one of Sora's obvious uh, videos. Yeah. Um, and they have crazy things. They have really creepy stuff like a, a armadillo bird or something. I don't know. Yeah. So. <laughs> well, they, they also have cute stuff like this. Yes, exactly. <laughs> How can you go wrong with puppies in the snow? How can you go wrong with puppies in the snow? Yeah. <laughs> just How's the cute? really scary part about this is this is as bad as it's ever going to be. I know. Like, right? like yeah, that's the scary part. That's what's really yeah. terrifying because that looks really good already. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, just look at look at the fidelity of the images, and um, and, and this is what right. perhaps I don't, I'm not sure, Arif, but could be thirty frames per second. But just look at the fidelity of it. So the whole idea of creating a world simulator, right? And Sora AI is a model that has been taught what our world is it understands the physics of our world and now it's advanced to a level where it has the capacity to simulate artificial worlds 
right? Uh, um, and, and John, you can you can uh, you know break down the technicalities of this a bit further, but the power of being able to synthesize artificial worlds, the power of being able to take a clip from a movie, perhaps, or just something you've shot on your iPhone, you know, put it into into Sora, and then Sora either fills in missing gaps or generates n number of you know extensions to that video. That is crazy. Uh, yes. Uh, so technically, the the uh, and once you've got a still frame image, and that's been uh, that seems like it's old now. It's like, oh yeah, yeah, we can make any image we want to, right? So your thumbnail for this, who knows? It might be a generated image, but. Uh, that doesn't seem that difficult, but when you think about 30 of those or 24 of those or 60 of those per second and everyone has to match up with the previous one, uh, you know, there was the, the famous Will Smith um, eating spaghetti, you know, thing a couple of years ago. And it was terrible right. because it was just moving all over the place. But you, even then you could start to see how things were going to go. But this continuity between frames is remarkable. And it, as you noted, this is all about world building. It's not about the sort of filmic output is kind of the the byproduct of it. It's it's that it's creating a three-dimensional world. It understands, yeah, <laughs> video generation models as world simulators is very, very much to the, the, the that's the point. So it's yeah. creating an internal three-dimensional representation of the world from watching 2D videos, which is really impressive. That that's that's not a small task. <laughs> so, I, I don't yeah. you know. That's something that's just incredible that that, that open yeah. AI. Is I mean, you you do. still have the odd cat with three paws and stuff. Yes, like that. But, yes. I mean, you know, as you said, this is <laughs> this this again was what, if I'm not mistaken, early February, and we're already mm -hmm. seeing you know mm -hmm. um, the model being trained and and like just more mind blowing stuff being churned out. Right. Just a couple of weeks back, Open AI took Sora to Hollywood, and it was very interesting just the, the outcomes that we've seen from that. And the first impressions are amazing. Or if you can help us from you know, a producer director's perspective, the fact that you can take an AI model and you can do this, can you just talk to the sort of production involved, the, the graphics involved, the post-production? And when you take away that entire process from the entire filmmaking process, what, what does it mean? How do you react to this? Uh, see, I, I react with a, extreme, a lot of enthusiasm and excitement because end of the day, we are creative people and anything new in that, any uh, anything with any, any perspective like this is very interesting, you know, which we've not thought but we've still grown up with like writing script and shooting it in a certain way and doing thinking in a certain boxed way. You know, which have you know, you learn from your Finn school and you move ahead, and you know. Yeah. But what this is going to do, this is empowering anybody and everybody in the world to think the way they want to think and come and create all kinds of stuff. You know, this. So it's I, a great I, I, democratizing force, right? Yeah. It democratizes the entire process of of creating a film. But then, is it mm. is it a tool in your toolbox, or is it a technology that's replacing you? It is a tool. It is a. It is another way of telling a story. Hmm. I mean, I am only looking at it like a two dimension, now, but I can think of it like four dimension now. You know, I mean, hmm. there are all kinds of things will happen. People have, uh, you know, like when I am sure none of Van Gogh's paintings sold at that point of time because it had uh, disfigured, and you know, there are paintings which are melting. In those guys could never sell it in their lifetimes, and but now we value it so much more. Because right. it was not fitting in that set, they were yeah. already thinking ahead. You know, uh, so similarly, I feel that this is something like that. That you know, a lot of people will come up with. There will be new creativity. There will be new types of creativity. But I do not think that this is going to take away, also, from a traditional way of filmmaking. People are used to consuming a two-hour film, two-hour movie, mm -hmm. or a OTT, or you know, all of these things will. Can still live, can still be simultaneous. Very important in. Um, see, I'm not a very technical guy. Okay, so I my my thing is more story writing. From writing, I've started directing, producing, and all of that. Right, but what I know very 
clearly is that you need characters you need actors to portray those characters you need the unpredictability and the versati- versatility and a robert de niro might bring which i do not think a predictable tool can you know can can be commanded to become what a robert de niro could do in taxi driver i do not think that it can be done at any stage by any other intelligence hmm. for it i feel i feel like that right now maybe 10 years later i'll be saying something else but that's what i feel so certain things are sacrosanct which will remain the way they are um so i don't know how character portrayal that's why i'm saying the main players will remain i feel mm. in the film and you know you, i i will make i'll keep making my traditional film but i will also have these things in my mind that i can do this and i will try and do certain whatever i can you know with this new technology mm. but I, is it but it is going to help me tell my story end of the day in a different way and and roy if i can if i can jump in real quick i think you know i think people on the outside think of creating something like a film or an animation as a monolithic process that just out pops but it's it's a process there are many yeah. many many steps in that process and just thinking about previsualization and the ability to do very rapid previsualization of yeah. of complex scenes using a tool like this so that's not even the filming process that's just yeah. a previous process but you yeah, can a say- simple storyboarding Yeah, right, but from simple storyboarding you could actually yeah. see the scene. Like what right. would it look like with the lights, with the actors in it, with the camera in these positions and you know, uh, that that would be pretty cool. <laughs> to yeah. be able to see that yeah. ahead of time. Yeah. yeah. And I'm I'm Arif I'm, I'm curious because you you you're a writer yourself. Um you know, we've seen Chad GPT evolve. Uh we're expecting what is it um GPT-5 uh sometime in the middle of this year which is, you know, by orders of magnitude far more capable and complex do you do you feel when you when you spoke about writing of script writing is this is this again an interim period that you see where it's not going to be disruptive as such because the technology is evolving at such a pace that you know it's it's just difficult to kind of wrap your head around okay if gpt4 could do this just can you just imagine what gpt5 could do and 6 and there on I feel that this will be disruptive for sure mm. and um but I do not understand the extent to which it can do because uh there is I I I put a lot of value on original thought original thinking original creativity which is this by definition this is not but can it come can it compare to a human being who can come up with something a uh, very interesting everything everywhere all at once kind of a concept you still need those people you still yeah. need them to drive it so this yeah. this is going to make it like a, anybody can do it you know yeah. whoever has a more whoever has more experience with prompting or intelligence with prompting can so it will it will make a certain standard it will standardize standardize uh, so so is is prompt engineering going to be a new role in the film industry across the world do you think Yes, yes, hundred percent, hundred percent. That's what, I, and I'm not even an insider, you know. <laughs> But yeah, I mean, uh, I, I have, I have, I made some presentations, uh, you know, to OTT uh, platforms using uh, Mid Journey. I have right. not used it. Somebody else in my office has used it. But right. it's so interesting to see that you know now you don't have to go after people and take and search for. endlessly and copiously for photographs and references you can create your own right so um, john's right like you know you can just make your film before you actually go ahead and shoot a film yeah but also you know so much of a script writer's personal experiences and learned experiences in life become part of what they create right um and i i i i want to get both your thoughts on this um arif for the creative part and john for the technical Do you think this is going to be the Achilles heel of large language models like ChatGPT where you know it's there's only so much that they can soak in from the written word and the, you know the historical context of our written word as a species and extrapolate from that without kind of first hand experience or is that enough 
John, let's start with you. Uh, sure, I'll, I'll I'll delve into the to the creative realm as well because I I've been teaching screenwriting for thirty mm -hmm. years, so <laughs> I, I've taught a lot of classes, and so I have seen many, 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 many students. Is there anything in, you don't do, John? I, I do a lot of stuff. <laughs> I don't do. That's chemistry. why you're doctor know it all. <laughs> I know, I know, but but I see a lot of. I, I've seen you know thousands upon thousands of early two very very good you know if I go to my beginning class all the way to the advanced classes and the quality of writing goes up, but the live the lived experience of even the very beginning students is the crucial part. And that's always the thing, you know, I try to pull out of them is like, what is your lived experience? How is your vision of the world unique? What story do you have to tell? As RF said, you know, the story is without a story. Sora's videos are really beautiful, but after 30 seconds, I'm already bored with them. It's like, yeah, okay. I don't care. Uh, it's beautiful and it's really interesting looking, but if it doesn't have a story, I don't care. Uh, which is why Airheads is better because they built a story around these shots. And so you've got a story there. So it's, it's already a better movie or trailer. Um, as far as technically is speaking, you're, I think you're referring to regressing to the mean, which is that, that all of these models are statistical. So they're always looking for the center of the bell curve. So, you know, what's the most likely next word? What's the most likely like next image? Yeah. <laughs> I mean, that's a cool shot, right? But yeah, without yeah. a story, it's, it's boring after 30 seconds. Um, but but so so it's always these models are always searching for what is the most likely thing and exactly what you're talking about is that it's going to just it could become um i don't know if you have wonder bread in in india but you know just really highly processed white bread that's incredibly boring but every loaf looks identical and so you go to the store and you know if you buy this loaf or that loaf it's going to taste exactly the same it's going to look exactly the same right but it's it's not nutritional <laughs> it doesn't give you any of the good stuff like homemade bread does so uh, i think that you know what arif is talking about is that there's going to be some sort of baseline there's going to be this stuff is going to be used to some level but then without the human input, without the human creativity, without the spark of desire, the emotional impact, uh, I don't, I'm a very firm believer that these AIs that only exist in a computer that only exist in language and stuff will not, they're not going to have the same experience as us. Now, when we want to talk about humanoid robots, that'll be a different story. But you know, what about AI experience. agents? What about when you have an AI agent that, that you can that, train on your, your life experiences, your life right. data? Like yes. someone like a, a Bollywood writer like RF or, mm -hmm. or someone in his office can train a repository, AI yeah, on the entire you know repository of your life experience. Right. What then? <laughs> Is there a way to share that though? I don't know. You know, can we? I wish I could plug my head into your head and then we could talk to each other instantly. But that doesn't. Maybe I don't. I don't know. You're <laughs> or maybe you don't. <laughs> but you know. But but that's the whole beauty of being humans is that we get to tell each other stories because hmm. nobody has the same experience. So I I don't know. I don't know what it's going to be able to do. Again, I think if we can get these things into bodies, like into humanoid form, then it gets more interesting. Because then they actually get to live life kind of like what we do. They get to actually interact with the world the way we do. And, and then they might have a more similar experience. I, I don't think a, I don't think something that lives in a giant server cloud like a, like a, a large language model, it's just not going to have the same experience as humans. So the best it's going to be able to do is pretend. And I don't know how well it'll pretend. Anyway, I should turn it over to Arif because I'm sure you have better thoughts about this than I do. <laughs> I am very impressed with your thoughts and and what and you are articulating everything that I I want to say very very well. So I would encourage you to carry on. My my, <laughs> my feeling is is that you know the every uh, the uniqueness that every person brings and mm -hmm. uh, that makes the makes the film a whole. You know, like like I, I like I said about Robert De Niro, but Robert De Niro is also not. He's also acting on prompts given by. Scorsese, who is also uh, behaving on prompts given by the script, so somewhere, so it's a process, you know. And uh, right. instead of Scorsese, if uh, Tarantino was directing, it would be very different. Mm. You know, every personality has, and we, you know, that's the beauty of filmmaking uh, per se. That I'm talking about live action, of course, and even animation to a certain extent. I'm not that deft in uh, animation. But, you know, every person brings their personality. You know, why do we choose a certain DOP? Why do we choose a certain designer? So 
you know, so those things I feel are still going to be there. But I, yeah, but the base, as John very rightly said, that white bread or the base, the I can I, I actually want to uh, want to do something now is that I want to make a first draft with AI, with the Chat GPT, because first draft is always like you put on all your thoughts and you know it's very raw and you know it's not and then you I want to do that with GPT and then carve out my script from it, so that can help me that way. Yeah, yeah, that'll be fascinating. You know, we should we should uh, get together again when you do that. <laughs> Talk <laughs> about it. <laughs> but so this this another interesting aspect. So there's so much of archival footage, right, um, that goes into so much of the filmmaking process. And take a look at this, right. So if you can if you can generate archival level quality footage um, that you know you have thought of on the spur of the moment in a few seconds. This is, what does this mean to the entire process? I mean, we've, we've talked about disruption, we've talked about changing of roles, but when it comes to things like this, there's also a cost factor that's associated with it, Arif. So what does this do to the filmmaking process and the costs involved in that? I mean, let, I mean your perspective from Bollywood, which is the largest film industry in the world? So it's the largest industry if you put in all the languages of India together. You know, because in South is making its own number of films and East and West and all of these guys are making. But yeah, the cost factor in India is especially very crucial because, you know, uh, you know, we've, I've, I've never met a producer who said that, go ahead, make a film or make this thing. We've got enough. And it's always like, oh, God, we are, we are, you know, always, there's always number yeah. crunching. And today, whichever kind of project you are doing and, you know, you have to make it within a certain the cost. Especially now, uh, India, I don't know if the rest of the world, but India is going through a bit of a phase post-COVID about the the theatrical release. Uh, There are very few OTT channels. So, you know, everybody's cost is getting restructured all the time. Anyway, so the important thing is, yes, it is, it it can, if used intelligently, it should be able to cut costs. But right now, as John's also saying, I'm seeing at the moment there are like clips they're uh, they're not real i don't know can you tell a story against this backdrop can you put your characters against this backdrop and think that this you know this uh, this whole thing will work out i'm not so sure right now yeah but like say transition shots or you know certain things which you end up uh, to show scale you can probably do some uh, you can you can have these kind of things but uh, i don't know if you can I, I'm not able to comprehend right now how to use it like a set, how to replace a set with AI, with, with this kind of a thing. What do you think, John? Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm thinking about that. So one of the problems that I have, and, and my experience, of course, because none of us actually have access to Sora yet, except for just a very few people, but um, with still frame images, if I just want it to be creative, it's great. You know, I'm like, make me a bunny rabbit with a chicken head or something. I don't know. You know, and it just makes something. But if I want something very specific, and as a filmmaker, that's most often what you want. I want a very specific shot with with a mountain here and a, a an old building here and a person walking across it this way with some with the stone cobbles that are kind of a light gray cut. You know, you have a very specific vision in your mind, and it's it's not that good at recreating that because it just kind of makes something. It'll be close, but it won't be what you want. So then we get to the point, I think exactly what you were saying is that it it requires, it can be good again for pre-visualization. It'll be great to get the general sense of it, but you're not going to, at least at this point, maybe in five years, it'll be different, but um, you you can't get it to be that exact. You can't say like, no, 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 no. I want, I want these things to be this way and to feel a little bit different. Uh, I mean, yes, you probably can eventually, but it's going to take you a lot of time. So, <laughs> you know, so that's the trade-off. You're, you're prompt engineering yeah. instead of going out and filming it, I guess, is, is the trade-off. But I do agree, Royden, like, like um, you know, you think about how much it costs to hire a drone operator to t- pull out a big camera and shoot a very, very large, impressive B-roll shot of kind of a spiral up or something like that. That's the kind of situation where it might be good enough as long as it's close. 
and you can just throw that in there, right? You just want the person, you know, you, the, the person's talking and you just want a quick shot of like like something flying up and out of the way and you're seeing them way down there. And and that could be accurate enough to actually use in a final film, depending on the budget and all of that kind of stuff. But yeah. I mean, and, and we've already seen um, Sora do this. Uh, I'm just trying to cue the, there you go. Right. Yeah, I was inspired so, by, well, there's that, that look boss at that. That's, that's, yeah, in the town. That's a, <laughs> that, you know, so the, so to, to have to replicate a shot like this for you know a movie or for a news story, um, there are certain costs involved, and in I was just trying to drill down on the cost of you know hiring a drone, a drone operator, getting to the location, you know everything that's involved in the production process and the costs from a cost perspective. Right. But and let's not forget, is, let's not forget if it just decides to rain that day and it's supposed to be sunny yeah. and you're like, oh <laughs> crap, you know, you just, everybody just sits around and waits till it decides to be sunny again. <laughs> so yeah. 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 Arif, your thoughts? But my thought, my thing is that, yeah, cost is one thing. I, 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 I was just getting reminded, uh, I was seeing a, just a clip of the making of uh, Oppenheimer by Christopher Nolan, of course. And he's actually going away from using um, you know, he's gone back to films and not into mm -hmm. digital. He's going back. He's, oh, he's okay. going the whole explosion, that nuclear explosion was actually not CG, you know. So there is a certain strength. If this Nolan guy is doing, we can, we know that he, this guy is serious about showing things real. Mm. Uh, when I'm watching that uh, clip of that, uh, of that Jeep, or, yeah, this thing, driving down this uh, vehicle. Yeah. I am somewhere, I'm also getting distracted at the moment. It will get better, of course, with, with time. But I'm also not mm -hmm. really believing that this is happening. I don't, my mind tells me it's not real. So if James Bond is sitting in this, in this vehicle, yeah. I will not, I will be disconnected, you know? Yeah, yeah, there's a, I, I have to say, and I agree, like with our, a lot of people said, wow, that's completely believable. And as soon as I looked at that, again, it's because of years of, decades of animation it's like it does i don't buy it if if a student gave me that i would say it looks visually very good but he, yeah. the gravity's wrong the way the smoke's coming out of the back of the car is wrong the truck is wrong um i think uh, I, I was going to say uh, i think one thing to really take account of and i think exactly what you're saying are to, to to riff on that just a little bit is the christopher nolan idea but i always like to use the chess analogy in, I think it was 97. I, I, <laughs> I looked at this recently, but, but you know, when Kasparov was beaten by Deep Blue and then computers became far better than humans at playing chess, everyone was like, oh, what's going to happen to chess? Well, there's still chess tournaments. Children still learn how to play chess. People still actually get paid to play chess. People like to watch humans play chess. They could care less if a computer is playing chess. Right. Yeah. Uh, if you have two computers playing chess, okay. nobody's going to pay money to see that. So there's a sense in which I could see a kind of a transitional period where everyone's like, oh, AI generated everything. But then just like with special effects with CGI, it was really big. And then people are going back to like Christopher Nolan saying, like, no, I want everything in camera. I want it all practical. So I, I think that what we would have is a reaction against that. So it'll probably get too big for a minute and then have to settle back down with an integrated back to humans being integrated, you know, involved in it. And and there will be this, I made my film without any AI, you know, in, in 2035, someone okay. will go yeah. like, I made this with no AI at all. And people will say, wow, how is that possible? You know? <laughs> yeah. Like no one going back to film. I'm taking a cue from you, John. And I, and I really believe that, you know, all these ideas are great, but ideas do not make a, ideas are just, you know, like an idea, like it can be like a five second or a five minute, at most it can last five minutes. But f making films is is another deal, you know, that idea has to become a, like a, you have to put people in for in a theater for two hours, you know. And, you know, like you say that after two minutes, I will not be fascinated by, by that car driving down whichever road. Well, let's look at, we, we don't even have to go to AI. Let's just look at some of the Marvel movies recently. They've just gone way too far into special effects and no plot. And they're boring. They're really boring. They're boring. <laughs> yeah. I, cannot tell, I cannot tell the difference anymore right. between so many films that come out. Right. They just right. look the same to me now. Yeah. You know, and Oppenheimer really stands oh, out. Yeah, yeah, yeah. really stands out. 
And honestly, <laughs> even very different, but even the Barbie movie that came out at the same time. So I remember, but that had a distinct look and feel and it was very different. You know, it just wasn't the yeah. same as everything else. So it's, it's, it's like that loaf of bread that you bake at home. It's not perfect, but it's much better to eat. You enjoy it better. What? Yeah. Ooh. All right. So great. But what about uh, voice AI? This is a bit crazy because we've seen um, teams like Eleven Labs bring out some very sophisticated voice products. Um, these have been around for a while, but you know they, they're getting even more, more and more complex. And you know it was very fascinating when I saw this uh, this news story. Uh, I don't know if you guys come across have come across it, but this is the first example, to my knowledge, of a direct impact uh, yeah. on you know on on the filmmaking industry. Um, to have a human actor replaced by an AI voiceover is not a very encouraging sign of things to come. Arif? It is not, but then it is unstoppable. You can't fight it. You can't fight certain certain developments, unfortunately, you know. Like when the I'm sure when the cars when the cars hit the street, the horsemen must the people uh, carriage drivers must be up in arms. But you know. Uh, but then, you know, an automobile industry became what it is. Similarly with internet and, you know, people, but it, uh, but every time we, what we do see, I, I, unfortunately, I think, yeah, I, I, my feeling is voice is some, anything that's happening in the background can go, can be replaced. Mm -hmm. uh, and if it is going to make more economic sense, then that is what is going to happen. You know, the world over, that's what happens. We're talking about individuals, countries behave like that uh, with other countries, you know. Yeah, so, yeah. so that that is something that if it is making more economic sense, that cannot get that, then there is no resisting it. At some point of time, mm. it will change. Yeah, but, but it's, I, I mean, what, what does it mean for then people like, like David Attenborough or Morgan Freeman, who, who just so, you know, they love the world over for, the, for their voiceovers? Uh, equally, you know, uh, it's just There's, what about it's crazy. What those, happens to these guys? People, their, their personality is more than just voices, you see. Um, so they there will be a handful of them that will be there, but but there is so much more that you hear in advertising, you're hearing some voices, you're hearing voices mm. in many from scale low scale to high high products and you know all kinds of things those yeah. are going to those are going to change some personalities will be there like that right. I, I'm not we cannot do without that yeah but um, john do you think is this is the time for so we've talked about data rights uh, and intellectual property rights do you think mm. uh, you know this enters the realm of you know <laughs> Where it's time, perhaps, for voiceover artists to to you know trademark their their work. I, I think you know, just like what Arf was saying, it, it, we're in a situation that's unstoppable, and 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 voiceover is a let's say a low hanging fruit. That's an easy place. So I, I think you know I've been thinking about this while while you were talking, and people at the highest end, the Morgan Freemans of the world, or David Attenboroughs of the world, they're still going to be okay because I think you know they'll probably have enough clout that if somebody tries to steal their voice that they'll say, Hey, you can't do that, whatever. And people will want them. The problem I think is, is again, it's like the catalog model that I've talked mm -hmm. about earlier. It's that it's just the rank and file person who's just making, you yeah. know, regular wages, things like that. Just yeah. they, they got to pay for their house and their, their food for their family and everything. Those people are the ones who are going to be in big, big, big trouble because it will yeah. be economically so much. There was, um, Oh, what's the name of the company? Maybe you can help me, Royden. But the company that did, they have 700 uh, uh, people who do service calls, you know, for if people have text. Klarna, Klarna AI. Klarna, thank you. And and they replaced that with, with uh, ChatGPT. And it went from, I think it was a couple of dollars US per phone call, per tech support thing, down to yeah. 0.02 cents. So it was, it was, you know, a two to three orders of magnitude less money to do it this way. Who is going to hire just a regular voiceover person to do a regular voiceover ad for a commercial for some pills you have to take or something, right? They're just going to have an AI do it. In fact, it's probably already happening. So that's going to be devastating for just, again, the people at the highest end are going to be okay. 
but it's the, just the regular people, <laughs> the lumpen proletariat who just uh, who just work and want to do their job. And those are the ones who are going to suffer, at least in the near term. See, I'll tell you, a brilliant example is what China did to the world. You know, they brought, brought manufacturing all of the world's. And what India did, you know, uh, all those service calls that you uh, from. Right. Uh, yeah. I mean, there's effectively it's the same thing. You're just doing it with AI, which is even more effective. So, yeah. 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 And, you know, I was talking to the the um, head of AI at Klarna a few days back, and um, they're already um, working with ChatGPT 5. They're already because, I mean, they have this tie up with OpenAI. They're already um, looking at taking this to the next level. And I asked him about. You know, how do you do you think there's a possibility of having an embodied AI assistant? You know, um, because Klarna, let's not forget, is is essentially a financial solutions company, um, and it's their clients that have, you know, these call centers that have these uh, customer service agents. And okay, he was very tight lipped, but you know, he didn't say no. <laughs> and I'm sure, I'm sure that I mean, he did say, you know, we've got a, we've got such exciting things ahead that you can't even imagine. So it's it's very clear that we're on the cusp of of entire sectors of the economy globally being massively disrupted, and voice, as you rightly said, John, perhaps is the lowest hanging fruit. Um, and and I mean, we were talking unfortunately about the, the 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 video that has had problems lately, but we had a whole discussion about universal basic income, and that's oh, yeah, where yeah. this begins to come in because. Yeah. There's the, the likelihood is that there is going to be such a degree of disruption to so many people, all the way from people digging ditches because we've got these robots coming online, all the way up yeah. to the most creative, you know, like painters and filmmakers and, you know, writers, etc. So the whole spectrum of, of human labor is going to be disrupted at very, <laughs> like almost at the same time. And that's never happened in history before. So we yeah. don't know how, how we're going to navigate that. That's, it's scary. Well, I have another, uh, very, go ahead. Definitely something, sorry. Uh, so that is scary because uh, I feel that, you know, there have been industrial revolutions and, you know, various uh, machines have come and replaced human beings. In, but it is also some very often led to bigger industries, you know, where, where air, airlines, for example, or, um, you know, I, um, grocery stores giving way to online deliveries and, and all of those things. But so there is some kind of a, it has opened up more op different kinds of opportunities, Uber, all of these kind of things. Yeah. So maybe there, the is, FSD comes out that there is something that we are not seeing yet that, right. uh, but we need to, I guess uh, you are, uh, you're pioneering a lot of stuff, John. So you would be able to see much more clearly what the future holds that where it can what are the where where, where will this land i i see the technology i don't the 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 societal impact is beyond me it it i really i wish i had a crystal ball and i could look forward 10 years i have i have this bad feeling it could be like all those horrible dystopic movies where it's smoke and ruins and everything because people went crazy but i'm hoping we can kind of get to the to that point um you know, this is something that's bigger than any of us. This is something that governmental entities and, and world bodies need to really be paying attention to because you yeah. can't leave people behind. And it, yeah. unfortunately, as with every revolution, probably the ones who are the most needy to begin with are the ones who will suffer the most uh, during the revolution. So it's like you, you have to have some sort of safety net for the people who who will be incredibly impacted and and might not make any money anymore you know that's that's a terrible thing but at the same time or if as you say you know every every revolution everyone has always been there's the famous story of the luddites who would break the looms because they said we're not going to have jobs but now that's just all industrialized and we have many more clothes than we used to have so we have you know objectively a better life in terms of our clothing choices than we did before the looms came around so you know, and people have found other things to work on. So they do other things instead of weaving fiber, um, yeah. which was probably a terrible job. <laughs> the problem with this revolution is that, and, and again, I didn't live through the automobile revolution or I didn't live through the industrial revolution, obviously, but, but a lot of it was, it was taking jobs that were not very fulfilling to people. They did them because they were like, you know, we need this 
I need money. I have to eat. I have to have a place to live. So you would do a job, but it wasn't a fulfilling job. But the problem now is there are many people who say, wait, I'm out of work. I love to code stuff. I love to do animation. Yeah. I love to write. And all of a sudden that job is gone. That The thing that I thought I was going to base my career on and I'd work 30 years in the industry and then I'd retire and everything would be great. So that's a, that's a major change is that it's taking jobs that people actually really enjoy doing. And, and that's, that feels much more unfortunate or maybe it's just me because it's closer to home to what I do. And right. so I feel it more closely. I, I'm not sure, but, but it, it, it seems like it's very different than these past revolutions have been. So, so then Arif, like what, what happens to, to institutes like the, um, the film and television Institute or whistling woods, for example, um, because we also have to look at the impact upstream when it comes to educating people who, who are just about to get into these industries, whether it is filmmaking or advertising or other creative sectors. Those institutes and that, that curriculum will have to evolve as well. Most certainly, most certainly. They will have to evolve and they'll have to include and stay on top of these changes, these rapid uh, advancements that are happening and and uh, they must impart that knowledge to their to uh, to the students, you know, whoever wants to learn, uh, and make empower them to, you know, to actually now the thing earlier it was mostly that you are going to make a film and you know you know certain sets, but now you have to also empower that if technology again changes in ten years time, how do you adapt to that also? Mm. How do you always keep keep uh, keep ahead, you know? It's not cool anymore to be to say that you know I'm technology technologically challenged. I'm, I'm like this. I'm old school. I don't think like I am not cool anymore. I really also need to if I want to survive these these waves. I need to be on top of it. Right, right. So you've you've also uh, dabbled in in you know short films. Um, that's one genre that, so we would, you were talking about you know, two hour long films and it perhaps will be very difficult to do, but as we saw with the airhead, um, you know, short, short format, that, that seems more ripe for disruption at this stage, but there's also another, uh, a genre, which is music videos. So essentially here, here's, here's a music video. The video is, uh, is, uh, generated by AI, the audio by AI. I mean, it's start to end. It's all AI. Right. Yeah. This this is an entire music videos. I mean, I'm you, you and I are old enough to and, and John as well to be from you know the MTV days when you still had music videos and they were the big thing, right? That's of course we've seen less and less of that, but Bollywood is all about song and dance. You know, what happens to the Bollywood songs uh when you can do this with, with AI? That is never gonna go away because you <laughs> I don't think you, anything intelligent can't take off. Anything, any, anything which has intelligence can't take off the dumbness of the Bollywood dance. <laughs> Especially when it comes to dancing around trees, right? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> and flowers, and he flowers touching yeah, each other. Especially dancing around trees and you know, doing all those gyrating numbers and stuff like that. I don't think AI is going to... <laughs> out. No, but at the same time... Uh, Again, this is very fascinating to watch, and I'm sure there's going to be rapid developments and all. But you know, my interest didn't didn't last on it through through the video. Mm. At some point of time, okay, fine. What's so? This is this is the it is it is like the drug that you get used to it very quickly, and then you want mm. more high, something a different high, or something. Show me something else. I would be very. I would want to know okay, what what is it that the Sora can do, which is very normal. Just show me a house on a hill and the breeze and this that how is that going to happen you know simple stuff which we you know we we what we we eat simple food every day we don't go to fine dining and this and that once in a while yeah but usually we are as human beings we do we have a simple ways we have, we do things 90% of the time we stick to simplicity so this I feel uh, till now whatever I've seen today also with you is something which is fascinating and wow and it's mind blowing but for five seconds. Yeah, um, John. Uh, well, I, I I was thinking as, again as a teacher I think about this all the time right now, but it's 
what do we say to people who are in their teens or in their 20s, their early 20s, who are just starting out? Because one of the problems is you don't want students, potential people going into the film industry or, or whatever industry, art, whatever. Yeah. You don't want yeah. everyone en masse to leave because the whole beauty of the next generation of all of these creative skills is that they build on this and that there's a, a large number of people that do it. And then out of that group, you know, you're not going to get your Christopher Nolan's or your uh, uh, Martin Scorsese's without a, a lot of people going into it and, and, you know, the few pop out. So in order to have those few geniuses, you have to have a large base. And if you don't have a large base because everyone's scared off because they say, oh, what's the use? That's where it becomes really unfortunate. It's not so much for folks that are our age. It's more for people who are half our age or, or, or less that, that are just starting out and could just say like, no, I give up. It's not worth it because the AI is doing a better job. So I hope that doesn't happen. The good part about it is most young people are far more optimistic and willing to go out there and do it anyway, even if people tell them they can't do it. So at least there's a group of those people in there. And so I'm, I, I hold out hope, you know, I remember what it was like to be young and, and silly and, <laughs> and just say like, I can do this, I can do this. Uh, it, you know, and it, that, that optimism based on nothing, but just the fact that you're still young and have a ton of energy is great. And so I hope that that carries through and that carries through us this, this period of time, because it is going to be scary. Whatever happens is going to be very, pretty scary. Any final words of wisdom from you, Arif? Um, Looking into the future, dear crystal ball. That you, yeah, you embrace embrace such stuff, and you go out, and people should try and express. These are all uses as tools of expressing better. Hmm. You know, um, I that's what I feel. Uh, what's going to happen five years down the line? Uh, <laughs> I, I feel that you know people. Uh, and you know, I think the, 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 what it needs to do is restructure the way people are taught. Uh, there, I think the the way institution work, institutions work, teaching institutions work, whether it is film, whether it is that. I don't think people, you know, we are very compartmentalized that you become engineers or civil engineers or uh, teaching students who are who are who are just um, doing film school. And that is what you want to do for the rest of your life. I think, no, I, I feel that, you know, people can, a human being can do many, many things. Like if I can direct a movie, I should also be able to make a chair, you know, or I should also may, be able to do uh, marketing. So I, I don't know, various, so I think that is that kind of thing, you know, you have to adapt to the situation. Uh, the schooling, I feel, has to change the way, especially the British brought about schooling in this world. I think that needs to get restructured and people need to be a little more fluid in, in, in how they're going to approach profession. It may be in future, it may be that I make a one film, I'm, I'm, my son makes a film and then he goes ahead and he makes a car. You know, why not? That's cool. Yeah. 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 Well, and that's a hopeful note. Everything yeah. works for them, you know, because, yeah. because there's a certain level at which people are operating all the time because of mm. technology. So it is easier for them to make a film and to make a car. Final thoughts, John, if any? I, I actually, I, I agree. I, I think that the final thought is, as always, the young generation is, is where our hope should lie. And let's not forget that all of this AI stuff is human generated right? We yeah. created this stuff. It's not like it just magically popped out of the air. So it is a testament to human creativity. And I think that humans are creative and flexible enough that we'll figure it out. We, it, I am very optimistic about the future. I fear it in the short term, but I'm very optimistic <laughs> about the long term. The future is good. It's bright and good, as Elon often says. All right, so go. let's stay hopeful. Let me just uh, pull up your profiles so uh, everybody who's tuned into this podcast can follow you, reach out to you. That's Arif Ali's uh, IMDb profile. Uh, and of course, let me bring up, this is uh, Dr. John Gibbs. Uh, this is artimatic.io. Uh, you can reach out to him on X. And please follow his uh, YouTube channel. Uh, I've been a longtime follower of, of John's. And I've learned so much, and uh, it's it's great what he does. Uh, thank you, John, for everything that you do. Yep. Uh, and uh, Arif, thank you for being you. 
<laughs> Thank you. <laughs> you know, the last of the directors, the great directors, right? Oh, I'll no, hope no. not. The first, hope of, the first, the of, the first of the next generation. The first of the next generation. Yeah, there we go. <laughs> really, He's going to kill me for this. On this, on this really, and talking to John and you, yeah. such a learning for me. Yeah, this was a great conversation. Thank yeah. you so much. Yeah. Thank you both. All right.